Imagine a future that looks like this. Or this. What does it look like? To me, it looks polluted, dirty, and for lack of a better word, disgusting. The water is so polluted, people are getting sick drinking from it. But hey, there's no choice. No choice, except if you are super rich, in which case you could probably afford to buy fresh drinking water, which is now so expensive, it's now worth more than oil. Am I scaring you? Well, this is what is happening in some parts of the world today. The future is already here. And this is what I'm proposing as a solution today. Let's use something dirty to clean our dirty water. Now, it sounds counterintuitive, I know, but hear me out because I'll tell you a story of how our research team was able to do exactly just that. So growing up in a metropolitan city in Canada, I never really had to worry about getting access to fresh drinking water. I actually loved drinking from the tap. So why do I even care about this issue? Well, it all started in sixth grade when our teacher asked us to present an environmental issue of our choice. And a really good tip, guys, if you want really good grades, especially for those of you who still have kids or are students still, is find a really big word that nobody understands and use it. Because I did. And that word is eutrophication. It's a 14-letter word, and in Latin, if you break it down, you is good, and trove means food. Sounds like something you want at your kitchen table, right? Except it's not really good food for us, but really great food for cyanobacteria. Or blue-green algae, it's more harmless name for it, like microcystis aeruginosa. Now, these guys might look super small and unassuming, but in reality, they're extremely toxic if you have too much of them around. It's all about balance. And when these start to spread, they're called algal blooms. And you've probably seen them before when you went canoeing on a lake in summer. It's like having too many relatives at your party. Soon they're all going to be screaming and killing each other. <laughs> Except these are definitely the guys you don't want to invite to your party. When these bacteria start to spread, they're called harmful algal blooms, or HAPs for short. And HAPs release a bunch of cyanotoxins into their environment, causing a bunch of health issues for all organisms. And one of these cyanotoxins is called microcystins. And microcystins specifically target the liver by inhibiting the protein phosphatase. Now, protein phosphatase basically acts as a traffic controller in our cells telling us which process to be active and which not to be. So you can imagine that having this protein inactive can cause a bunch of issues. Long-term exposure can result in liver cancer, and acute effects include gastrointestinal problems, like diarrhea, vomiting, and stomach aches. It can also cause severe headaches and fever. But that's not the only thing HAPs do. They basically choke the water from oxygen causing a bunch of marine animals like fish and everything else that depend on it to die. Because it is so dangerous, the World Health Organization has mandated that concentrations of microcystin not exceed one part per billion. To put that into perspective, that's like putting one drop in 500 barrels of water. In Canada, that limit is slightly higher at 1.5 parts per billion, which is a slightly bigger drop. You get the picture. But we have to get to the root of the problem. And remember about those relatives I told you about at your party? Well, if you take away some of the food, then maybe less of them will come. Or at least the ones that are annoying and picky, anyways. <laughs> and to do that with blue-green algae, all you have to do is get rid of their favorite food, which is phosphorus. Now, it's not that it's there, but that there's too much of it. Again, it's about balance. So, what's knocking it off balance? Well, humans, of course. The most prevalent source of nutrient pollution is actually in your own poop. 
And yeah, this guy looks cute and all, but it literally stinks, as you guys can probably imagine. And while in developed countries, this isn't much of an issue with our developed water systems, think of fertilizer runoff into water from agriculture and industry. Think about factory farms. We have millions of animals being crammed into a tiny building, producing tons and tons of poop. Think about climate change and warming temperatures that are sustaining the growth of algae. As a researcher, this is sort of beyond my control. So, what are the solutions? Well, you can reduce the concentrations of things by adsorbing them onto material. Now, adsorption, absorption, they practically sound similar, right? But they're totally different concepts. Absorption refers to something that enters a material, like water does to a sponge. Adsorption is when you have something that attaches or adheres onto a surface of material, like paint to a wall. The overall effect is like enticing your relatives to go to a disco so you can have all the fun. Here's a picture of one of my graduate students, or the graduate students that I'm working with, holding a piece of clay that she collected from Fort Nelson, BC. And clays are found in the ground, made out of a combination of aluminum, silica, and oxygen. And they have certain properties which allow compounds to be attracted to a surface. And what are those properties, you might ask? Well, let's get electric. So you know how people say opposites attract? Well, not only does it explain your miserable dating life, but it also explains the reason why adsorption occurs. Basically, when you have a positively charged surface, negatively charged compounds will be attracted to the surface, and vice versa. And with clays, this happens. Some of you might call this love at first sight, but for scientists, we call it Columbic Interactions, the name of the next great rom-com. <laughs> but anyways, this happens more often than you think. Doctors use the same principle to remove toxins in your body using activated charcoal. And your nose does the same with bacteria and dirt. But here, at the Northern Analytical Laboratory Service, or NAUS for short, at the University of Northern British Columbia, we find that clays have great potential to remove microcystins and phosphorus using adsorption. Now, this is a great discovery because Unlike other methods of toxin removal, clays are more environmentally friendly since they are sourced locally, they are found as part of their natural environment, and they have the potential to be reused. As I mentioned before, these clays were actually found accidentally by a construction company when they were excavating the ground for building developments in Fort Nelson. Okay, well, you're still not convinced that something dirty can clean our dirty water, right? So here are our results. Using an instrument called HPLC, we find that there's a peak when an algal toxin appears in the water. Now, when we mix that with clay, you find that peak is gone. It disappears. It's no longer there. The same can be said of phosphorus with an instrument called ICP-OAS. Unfortunately, ICP-OAS doesn't give a really good visual, so you're going to have to take the machine's word for it. But overall, we find that clays can adsorb microcystins and phosphorus with over 90% efficiency, which is great news. Okay, so does that mean that we should go digging clays and depositing them in our water? While this is promising, there's a lot more work to be done. Like, how do we remove phosphorus and microcystins from clays without leaching them back into the water? And is there the potential to reuse these clays indefinitely or at all? And what are exactly in these clays that are causing the adsorption? The questions we can ask are endless, and research takes a painfully long time to answer them. You'll find that even if research does generate knowledge, it does have the unfortunate habit of isolating people from that knowledge, even though it's supposed to do the exact opposite. Because even if we do use clays to adsorb phosphorus and microcystins, it's just a band-aid solution. There's only so much we can adsorb before things start going down the drain again. 
no pun intended. So just because we have clays as a solution doesn't mean we can go polluting our water with no consequences. But hey, why are we even talking about purification? Isn't the earth filled with water? So what if a few water bodies are hab infested? We don't drink from green water. Well, let's think about it. Water is life. Without it, everything on earth as we know it wouldn't exist. You are made of 60% water, and without it, you would certainly die. But right now, we're running into a water quality crisis. Around the world, people are using water at an unprecedented rate, and the water that we do have is extremely contaminated. According to the National Geographic, only 2.5% of the Earth is fresh drinking water. Even less of it is accessible, only 1%. So we have to purify it. There is no other way. And it's not only happening in developing countries. Remember that photo I showed you before with all that green stuff? Well, here it is again. Can you guess where that is? That is Lake Erie, filled with HABs containing microcystis bacteria. Because of HABs, the whole city of Toledo and Ohio and its 500,000 residents were left without fresh drinking water for several days. And why did this happen? Because that green stuff spreads, and the toxins it produces, they're invisible. You can't see them. Lake Erie and the other Great Lakes represent 21% of the Earth's fresh drinking water. In Canada, we are so lucky to have it in our backyard. So let's take care of our water. And that responsibility doesn't only fall on me as a researcher. This is where you come in. You need to take this knowledge into your own hands. These haves are caused by humans through their activities, so surely we have the power to stop it. And I will try to help you with that. First of all, let's prevent phosphorus from entering our water in the first place. That means checking your fertilizers to see if there's phosphorus in them. Has phosphorus? Opt for something else. Also, use water only when necessary. That means when it's raining outside, please don't use your water sprinkler because it's going to cause those nutrients to go into our water from the soil. Also, Reduce your consumption of meat. Don't support factory farms. Not only is it going to help the animals and you to be healthy, but also it will keep our water ecosystems healthy as well. These are all small alterations to your daily life that will make a huge difference. And we can't do this alone. Here at NALS, everyone is working on an aspect of eutrophication in one way or another. There is no one solution to stopping eutrophication. It requires the cooperation of researchers, scientists, politicians, lawyers, you name it. And especially people in our communities. And by the term community, I use it broadly. Because this story has to do with more than just us. It's about being part of a big and happy family. And yes, that includes your annoying relatives too. Because even though I've been criticizing this concept of families this whole time, we share this earth whether we like to or not. The water is no exception. Chances are, if we dump something into someone's backyard, it will end up in ours too. Or, if you're like my lab colleagues, you'll hate it when I leave my mess around in the lab for you to clean up. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. So, what have I learned since I was 12 years old about this word, eutrophication? Well, I learned that not only is it a big problem, it's a big and dirty problem. And dirty problems require dirty solutions, literally 
with clays, and also with you. We need to realize the you in eutrophication. The future is right at our doorstep, and we have a choice in what it becomes. Do you want a future where our water is no longer drinkable? I think you know the answer to that. And even if we have all the best solutions in the whole wide world, it will take a long time to implement if we don't change what's in here and in here. So let's drink to that. Thank you.